Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Dr. Jessica Terhar, and I'll be talking to you today about um, the art and science behind fermented foods. Uh, apologies that this presentation wasn't able to go up sooner, but I'm very excited to be talking to you today. My disclosures are uh, listed on this slide. I'm the scientific director for the International Probiotics Association. Uh, furthermore, I'm a consultant within the probiotic and microbiome spaces, and I I'm very happy to be talking about fermented foods because it brings together two of my main loves, and that is nutrition and food and microbiology. Uh, note that the opinions presented here are my own. Um, they obviously represent summation of the, the scientific literature, but do not represent the opinions of any of the above organizations. So what we'll be talking about today are sort of three parts to this presentation, what fermented foods are and what they're not, how they're made, and what do they actually do for us? So just jumping right in, and you might've seen this slide before if you saw my presentation earlier um, in this event on uh, should, pro should healthy people take probiotics. So we have microbes all around the world um, on this planet and 99.999, et cetera, percent of them are healthy, are beneficial and less than 1% cause disease. So if we take that subsection of beneficial microbes that are all around us, in us, in our food, in the soil, et cetera, a further subsection of those would be dietary microbes, those that are derived from food and, and drinks and, and various supplements. And the part that I want to zoom in on today is, is those that ferment our food, so the, the microbes responsible for fermentation. And if we think about dietary microbes, as I mentioned before, there's various reasons to ferment foods, but there's also various um, amounts and sources of dietary microbes. So you start off obviously with the highest amounts in terms of the microbial content or biomass, and that would be you know greater than a billion ten, typically um, live colony forming units per gram for probiotics food for, for probiotic food and food supplements. Whereas on the lower end of the scale, you, you tend to have you know, less than 10 to the five um, CFUs for fresh food. So your lettuce, um, apples, and, and so on and so forth, it tends to have a lot less than obviously fermented foods or probiotic foods. And again, there are so many reasons to ferment foods. Um, we've been doing it for a long time, and not only preservation, enhanced storage, um, increasing the nutritional value, there's flavor reasons, taste, textures, uh, definitely benefits, and for some it's, it's cultural. We see fermentation in nature all the time. Uh, ruminants, for example, the cows have four chambers in their stomach and that allows them to convert uh, the, the grasses and, and the, the foodstuffs that they eat into usable products, but obviously methane comes out of that, that's one of the byproducts. And sometimes, well, I'm, I'm up in, in sort of a bit more of the rural area in Canada, and we tend to have apples or fruit that fall from the trees. And sometimes you'll see some, um, some of the wild animals walking a little bit woozy around there because they've, you know, had some fermented apples. So uh, fermentation exists in nature all around. Some seeds even need the, the fruit to ferment before the seeds can germinate properly. So it's not an unknown process. And if we dig back in history for tens of thousands of years, we've been fermenting foods for so many different reasons. Uh, you know, if we take dairy, you know, milks, uh, fermenting milk gave us a way to uh, not only store it longer and improve its flavor, but give it different um, attributes and allowed us to transport this valuable liquid. Even just on the, the topic of liquids, you know, some cases potable water was not an option. So beer, wine, again, sour milks, things like that would be a great way to stay hydrated and, and to promote nutrition. So um, microbes have been involved in fermentation with respect to humans for a long time. There's a lot of ancient texts that support this, um, everything from, again, dairy to meat to, to various vegetables and fruit. What I wanted to jump into now, being the first part of the presentation, is really what fermented foods are and what they're not. So the most recent definition um, by Maria Marco and, and some wonderful ISAP scientists is, 
foods made through microbial, sorry, de desired microbial growth and enzymatic conversion of food components. So you can sort of think of this as controlled digestion of various components within foods using particular microbes. Really, it's harnessing the um, the ultimate power of microbes, if you will. And I wanted to make a very strong distinction, again, between probiotics and fermented foods. So probiotics are live microorganisms, which when administered in adequate amounts confer a health benefit on the host. So something could be a probiotic, but it might not be a fermented food because a fermented food typically does not have a defined microbial consortia. So we don't always know what's in a microbial ferment, whereas probiotics are very characterized. They're very targeted in their benefits. Typically, they're supported by at least one clinical study for the various health outcomes, especially in Canada with our um, probiotic monograph model for regulations. Whereas you might not know what's in the SCOBY um, or in the kimchi ferment that you have or the pickles or the, the, the wild sausage. Um, and sometimes you will know, for example, you can have a probiotic fermented food. So the, the most common example of this would be a yogurt that's been made from, you know, the yogurt cultures. So your, your Streptomophilus and your, your, for example, Lactobacillus vulgaricus strains. And then you might have, so that'll produce the yogurt itself. And then you might add a probiotic microbe afterwards or microbes afterwards to generate a probiotic yogurt. But fermented foods in general are not per se probiotics. So we need to be very responsible with um, how we use these terms and who better than those interested in food to, to further propagate this message. So probiotics and fermented foods tend to be distinct. You can have something that is a probiotic fermented food, but typically if it's not characterized, in other words, you don't know what went into it um, or what is currently in it, it doesn't have a clinical study to back some of the um, health benefits and um, it's not well characterized, then it's not per se a probiotic. So just in terms of what fermented foods are and not, here are some summary sound bites. Um, typically they contain live active microbes, not always. Some are pasteurized um, or filtered afterwards to remove the microbe microbes uh, to stop the fermentation. So that's just one distinction. Uh, fermentation tends to improve the texture and taste of certain foods. Uh, it increases the digestibility, the nutrient availability. It, it will produce certain vitamins in foods. Um, a great example of reducing anti-nutrients would be phytates. Um, that's a fairly common and well-known one. Uh, fermentation tends to reduce pathogen biomass and food spoilage microbes, and that usually is through um, creating the more acidic environment. Uh, but again, fermented foods are not always probiotic per se. So let's be sure to make that distinction. And if we jump into how fermented foods are made, um, typically you have um, a variety of organisms that can be used. These can be yeasts and bacteria, and, and they tend to produce a number of byproducts that almost, well, in the Latin, fermentare is to, to leaven, to rise, or, or to boil even. And so these bubbles that come up at, to, at the top of the, the ferment, usually, you know, in your beer, in your, um, your sauerkraut and so on, these are the byproducts of these, this microbial um, action. And again, different organisms produce different end results. But it's interesting to note that there is quite a distinction between fermentation and putrefaction. So you can think of fermentation as a more controlled, desirable microbial activity that yields, uh, you know, edible, tasty foodstuffs. Whereas putref uh, putrefaction, excuse me, is the uncontrolled decay through undesirable microbial action, which yields to typically compost. And Again, this is controlled through the various selective pressures within the processes. So temperature, um, oxygen availability, uh, the time of fermentation, the starting materials, and so on and so forth. If you're fermenting, you can go one of two routes, either a natural or spontaneous ferment, or um, sometimes you'll use a starter culture. If we take the example of apple cider vinegar or a vinegar, 
uh, you can use the microbes that are naturally present in the raw material. So you might take your apple peels or your, you know, chopped up apples, however you're gonna to start it and throw them in, in a jar, a sterile clean jar and, uh, you know, add water and, and, and let it sit in a cool dark place for a couple of weeks, then check on it every so often. That's definitely a way to use the natural microbes that are within the apple. So for those of you who don't know, there was some interesting research done in Austria, I think in the province called Styria, and they demonstrated in their particular subset of apples that, you know, there's over a hundred million um, different, or sorry, a hundred million um, CFUs in apples. That's in the, the core and the peel and the skin and the flesh of the apple. So let's not forget that our food is living, right? But natural ferments tend to take a little bit longer. Um, they tend to have a little bit more of a variety in the flavor and the texture profiles of the end products. And so a lot of people tend to rely, especially on the commercial scale, they'll tend to rely on a starter culture, which gives them a lot more control, a lot more, um, less variability, forgive me, in the end product. And, and this allows you to um, use microbes that are very well adapted to that particular food environment. So in the case of the apple cider vinegar, you would use probably um, some sort of a yeast, uh, not for bread, but probably more for wine making because it'll have similar pathways to create the acidification of the, um, the various sugars and stuffs that are in there. So you'll add that to your, you know, apples and your, your water and you'll let that sit. And then you, you know, you develop the mother culture or the and then you go from there, right? So you tend to have a more consistent uh, flavor profile over different batches. And again, this presentation is not to teach you how to ferment foods. It's to really give you a bit of a background, assuming that um, you're aware, firstly, that obviously fermented foods exist and, and you have a basic grasp of sort of what they are, but really to jump into more of the science. And as I said before, various organisms will produce various end products given the substrates that they'll be using. So we talked a little bit about vinegar just now. Um, you can use some uh, acetobacter bacteria, you can use yeasts, you can use a number of different organisms. And this is just a great example of, of some of the typical end products that you might have. Um, ethanol is one of them, um, acetone. Uh, obviously wines, beers, your typical cheeses and, and, and other things. I wanted to include some tips for fermentation because I know many of you will likely, if you're interested in this topic, you likely will dabble, if not already um, do fermentation yourselves. Um, so if you're curious, there's a couple of slides um, that I wanna sort of delve into a little bit of science behind some of the, the tips that I'm gonna give you. Using a starter culture, as I sort of hinted at before, gives you a more consistent product compared to a wild ferment, and it also takes less time. When you're using a starter, however, um, you don't wanna per se reuse it. Now, granted, if you make a lot of sourdough bread, you're like, Jesse, what are you saying? I constantly reuse my starter. Well, it will be different from the original mother culture. If you make your own starter culture for sourdough, you add the same flour, the same water, the same temperature, you keep it all the same, the microbes will still evolve. They will still mutate, they will still change slightly. That's just what they do, microbes typically do this. Um, and that's not a problem. You'll still typically end up with a very nice loaf of sourdough bread. Um, but even if you're using a SCOBY to, to inoculate and re-inoculate, what I'm trying to tell you is that microbes are changing constantly and it, will likely be different over time. It's just how it happens in the microbial world. So don't use them too often. And if you do use them often enough and, and reuse them, just expect that there might be changes in your end product. A lot of ferments um, tend to require an anaerobic environment. So if you're making, making water kefir, for example, with, or kefir as our um, Irish colleagues say, with dried figs, you know, that needs to be a sealed vessel, likely with an airlock. Whereas if you're making sauerkraut or kombucha, then you do want oxygen in the environment. Um, maybe not at the surface of the liquid, but you do need oxygen to be able to diffuse through, depending on what you're uh, making them. And the, the reason for that is, is really safety. You wanna make sure that pathogens aren't gonna be overtaking your um, main microbial uh, 
um, players in your composition. If you see any molds, they could be white, they could be black, they could be green, they could be all sorts of colors, dispose of the product. Um, this, this level of um, sort of infiltration of the microbial mixture could have produced toxins already. It, it, it can leave spores within your um, uh, ferment uh, and even the roots of molds often are invisible. So it's best not to take chances. Uh, temperature is a very important determination in fermentation. So if you're looking at cheeses, for instance, soft cheeses need, um, well, they can sometimes even ferment at room temperature, but they tend to hover sort of sort of between the fridge and between room temperature. Whereas hard cheeses, for instance, would really like colder environments and, and their, their work, their microbial work happens over a longer period of time. So temperature is a very important selective pressure in fermentation. Water activity is another one. And this, this is more relating to meats when you're drying out, for example, sausages or prosciutto or, or salumis or salami, sorry. Um, and this is really important again, and I'll stress this later on, to follow proven recipes and use um, the appropriate ingredients. When you are uh, doing a spontaneous fermentation, um, you have to, you always run the risk that there could be some sort of pathogen growth, but you hope ideally that you achieve acidification quickly because that's what will um, inhibit further pathogen growth. And again, pathogens often represent not only a safety challenge, um, but also you can completely change the flavor profile and the texture of the end product um, if, if the environment isn't acidic enough. And uh, something below pH 4 is, is a pretty good target. Keeping in line with the acidity, um, you'll, for example, if we take uh, cucumber pickles, uh, you can use a brine with salt um, to ferment the pickles, I'm sorry, the cucumbers, or you can use a, a vinegar concentration. Now, both of these, again, reduce the pathogenic load, the, the biomass, the ability of pathogens to grow and overtake and possibly turn your lovely cucumbers into compost, um, as opposed to allowing the more lactic acid producing bacteria, or in this case, the vinegar, to um, acidify the environment and to ferment the, um, and the cucumbers. Granted, um, both of those particular routes to ferment or processes will generate a slightly different tasting product. And that's because when you're using vinegar um, to pickle the cucumbers, it tends to be a bit sharper. Whereas if you're using a brine to ferment the cucumbers, then the microbes have a much broader flavor profile. Um, it's, inter it's interesting to me to note that that type of fermentation happens a lot more outside of North America, actually. Whereas in North America, we tend to have a lot more uh, vinegar pickles, uh, but if you haven't tried the brine or lacto-fermented pickles, highly recommend them, they're delicious. When you're fermenting, use the freshest or the highest quality foodstuffs that you can. And this leads back to one of the earlier comments I made that microbes are in our food, on our food, all around our food. So if you're starting off with apples that are sort of on the fringe, your product might not be as good because you don't know what microbes are um, typically overgrowing or dominating that particular population. So it's not to say that you cannot, but just be cautious and, and recognize that you might not achieve the same desired result. Uh, again, obviously you wanna use clean and sterile materials and equipment, but uh, try to use the highest quality uh, produce and, and ingredients that you can find. And also note that there will be differences between summer and winter. Cheese is made in the summer with summer milk compared to winter milk, which is typically not done traditionally, um, are very different. Uh, even if you're fermenting yogurts or, or um, I've, I've heard of people fermenting butter as well, there's a completely different flavor profile and, and color and all of that. So they'll yield different products depending on the season. Each ingredient matters in your recipe. It's very important to use proven recipes. If you're taking, talking about alcoholic fermentation, you know, the sugars are converted to a number of different products by the microbes, but um, you don't want a higher concentration of 
ethanol to alcohol, for example, in your wine or your beer. And so really try to follow these recipes if you are doing fermentation at home uh, for your own safety. And again, another safety tip is, you know, check the seals, use airlocks when appropriate, because if you have a compromised seal, don't risk the product unless, you know, it was made yesterday and you're, for example, pressure canning and, um, you know, things like that uh, to stop the ferment. But um, make sure that you're fairly rigorous about the oxygen environment, because that really plays a role in, in how pathogens can dominate or are inhibited. And lastly, as I, as I sort of hinted at earlier was, Fermentation time is a, is a fairly important factor. Some products actually undergo multiple ferments. So with certain wines or cheeses even, you could have two to three um, fermentation steps or stages. And that's obviously gonna take a lot more time than uh, a yogurt that can ferment and, and culture within 24 to 48 hours at home, right on your counter or commercially, you know, eight hours or something like that. So transitioning to what in the last part of the, the slides, what fermentation, fermented foods actually do for us. There's a lot of different um, reasons to consume fermented foods, but one of them is sort of the, the nutritional benefits and also health benefits. And I'll, I'll zoom into a couple of selected examples of each of those. I kind of like this slide. It's, it's from a presentation or a, a, sorry, a publication by uh, Maria Marco and her colleagues. And they talk about a lot of the different mechanisms of action whereby uh, fermented foods can impact our bodies and our health. And I'm not gonna go into the mechanisms per se, but I'd rather sort of on a surface level dive into some of the uh, various benefits. And, and in this case, these are nutritive. So they could contain beneficial microbes or potentially probiotic microbes. And one example of that would be um, kefir or kefir or kefir, which could contain various enzymes that help the body to just lactose, which is fabulous for those that are lactose intolerant. And obviously yogurt also has a lesser amount of lactose than um, a traditional milk, a raw milk, or not a raw milk, um, an unfermented milk. Another benefit could be the conversion of various compounds to biologically active metabolites. So when you are fermenting wine in one of the early ferment stages, remember they can have, they have multiple fermentation stages in for wine production. Um, some of the ethanol produced actually enhances the extraction of, for example, resveratrol and other polyphenols from the, the grape skins. We talked about phytic acid before, and, and just to give you one example, I mean, I think many people know about soaking your legumes and your grains, but even with um, sourdough bread manufacturing, various lactic acid bacteria can degrade phytates during um, the fermentation process. And that not only reduces the anti-nutritive effect of the phytates, but also enhances mineral absorption. Some selected health benefits um, would be associated, for instance, with a yogurt-rich diet. And there's a lot of um, research that's been done on the dairy aspect of fermented foods. So obviously lactose intolerance, and I should note that that is the only health claim right now that I'm aware of anyhow in Europe uh, for microbes in this sense. Uh, and they have been associated with a reduced risk of metabolic syndrome in, in specific populations, uh, reduced risk of bladder cancer. Um, in a US study that was sort of earlier this, this century, uh, reduced weight gain in US adults. Kimchi and, and some other vegetables have been demonstrated to reduce mainly in the um, metabolic space, but also reduce incidence of um, asthma and atopic dermatitis, whereas you can see improvements sometimes in specific populations with fasting blood glucose and triglyceride levels and such. I thought it would be interesting as well to dive into fermented foods in a more global context relating to food guides, given the nature of, of this group. Now in Canada, we have yogurt in our food guide, and I'll get to that in a second, but in other areas of the world, you do see the presence, uh, but no direct recommendation of consumption of fermented foods. The only exception to that globally is India. So in India, it is recommended that pregnant women, um, uh, pregnant women consume higher amounts of fermented foods, um, sprouted grains and legumes and things like that. So that's the only place where it's explicitly mentioned that those foods should be consumed. 
whereas other areas you might have a visual representation of fermented food. So here in Portugal, you have um, your yogurt, some cheeses. Um, in China, you know, you, you don't have as much of the visual presentation, though if you're looking at tofu um, and in traditional Chinese cooking, you, you would expect that there are, you know, your kimchi and your, your, your um, fermented cabbage and, and, and radishes and so on and so forth. Um, in Switzerland, up here, for example, you know, there is minimal presence of fermented foods. Um, again, in Canada, we have yogurt that's explicitly named. We have cheeses, uh, but it's minimal. Uh, so the U.S. obviously has um, its own pyramid, but it's interesting to note that there is, there is enough evidence to, whether it's anecdotal case studies or even clinical trials um, or longitudinal um, observational studies, to demonstrate that there is a benefit of consuming fermented foods. We know historically that that um, has played a huge role in um, not only the food preservation aspect, but also the um, migration of cultures and the socioeconomic perspective. But it's interesting to note that, as I, sorry, to finish my train of thought, um, that the food guides haven't, with the exception of India, haven't explicitly talked about this. and. It's interesting because, especially today, 2022, we're in a situation where for the last two years, we have had less of an exposure to beneficial microbes because of either lockdowns or reduced access to food, not as much exposure to the outdoors or pets or nature and things like that. And as I mentioned sort of at the beginning of my talk, fermented foods can be a good way to introduce um, or to reintroduce beneficial microbes into our diet in a safe way. And there's some associations globally and, and internationally are working on um, some projects related to this. So at the IPA, um, we're working on looking to find supportive evidence linking the consumption of dietary microbes to various health and nutritive benefits in Europe. And the ISAP and the IFNS, they're looking in a, at a more US focused approach and, and they're looking into the NHANES database. I believe they have a publication, if it's not already published, it will be published shortly, that's looking for associations um, on the consumption of various sources of dietary microbes in the US. And they're also, um, they've, they have a paper call, or they, they've had one out already um, to review the evidence that's already supporting this idea. So there is some um, association work even on the concept of boosting or turbocharging, if you will, um, the consumption of dietary microbes, whether that's through probiotics, obviously, or fermented foods, um, because they are important for health. And just to round off with some concluding remarks relating to fermentation, you know, it, it's, it's obviously more trendy and artisan in some circles, but there are still many misconceptions and myths, and I'm really pleased that I could share some of the research, hopefully, and dispel some of those myths for you. And again, I want to emphasize probiotics are not necessarily fermented food. Sorry, fermented foods are not necessarily probiotics, but they can be depending on um, whether or not a probiotic strain has been added um, to the product. Fermentation and putrefaction, obviously we're talking about a desired product, an undesired product, an uncontrolled product versus a controlled product. So keep that in mind. And properly made fermented foods have excellent safety records. We've been consuming them for thousands of years. I mean. Humanity has literally been built upon fermented foods as, as sort of building blocks for our health and nutrition. Of course, care should be taken when preparing fermented foods at home. So finding good resources, using proven recipes and, and try to use as, as high quality items as you can. There are so many reasons to consume fermented foods, um, whether you're interested in the taste, the benefits, the, um, the different flavor, or just your, your food curious. They're, it's a great way to add good microbes to your diet to compensate for some of the limited exposure we have nowadays. And with that, I will thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions offline. And I wanna thank again the organizers for the invitation uh, to, to speak to you all. Thank you so much.